on, let's stand together tonight, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise in this house. I want to scream it out.
in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name oh yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days oh yes i will for all my days yes i will yes jesus because i choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Yes, I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Oh, yes, I will. Lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all. Father, we just choose to praise you tonight. We thank you, God, for your goodness and grace. We magnify you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. Yeah. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, sing that again. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, yes, I will sing of the goodness of God.
I've laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, let's praise Him in this house. Amen. Is He good, church? Hallelujah. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Come on, declare it. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Hallelujah. Come on, just praise Him one more time tonight. Amen. He is good. He is faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Father, we thank you tonight for your presence in this place. May your word go forth, God, and accomplish everything that you will and desire it to. Our hearts are open to receive it. In Jesus' name. And the church declared, amen. Well, listen, do not be seated tonight till you turn and greet somebody. And welcome to all of you joining us online. God bless. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Hey, a couple of quick announcements real fast. Uh, men's ministry, there's an otters game going on this Saturday night. Uh, if you're interested, men going, if you want to bring your families, you can. Uh, what Pastor Rob needs to know tonight is if you are coming and bringing your family that you would let him know. We're trying to buy a block of tickets. If you could bring my microphone down just a little bit. Uh, so uh, you can sign up in the back. If you know how many tickets you need, go ahead and write that down. And then also, uh, this Sunday after our second service, we'll be having a baby shower for Emily and baby boy Seton. So, oh, she, oh, there she is back there. I was like, she was sitting right over here, and she moved on us. So T Hannah's got uh, cards up front. So if you didn't get a card to remind you, uh, you can get one of those after the service. Amen. If you got your Bibles with you tonight, Matthew chapter 6, 
We're jumping back in. This is going to be kind of the theme uh, throughout the, the next several months is that we're going to jump in and out of this sermon series that I entitled Sermons That Shape Us, studying through Matthew chapter five, verse, or chapters 5 through 7. So we've actually already studied through all of chapter 5. Uh, we're moving into chapter 6 tonight with a message called Secrets, all right? So let's start in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give, give to the needy. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that you are, your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You know, uh, keeping secrets doesn't seem like something that would be a part of Jesus' overall discipleship plan, right? <laughs> if you stop to think about it. I mean, think about keeping secrets. You know, uh, when you look at this past, secrets are not typically seen as healthy, are they? When we're keeping secrets from people, they're often connected. I was reading some uh, magazines about, I I shouldn't say magazines, articles online from magazines uh, that talked about how secrets are connected to increased anxiety, depression, and poor health. That, that is primarily because secrets have become a vessel by which we deceive others by withholding or concealing information from them either for their detriment or for our benefit. So we keep secrets, for, you know, it, it, either for their detriment because we don't want them to, to flourish or we keep secrets for our benefit. However, the definition of secret is much less ominous when you look it up. Here's the definition. A secret is something that is kept or meant to be kept unknown or unseen by others. So Keeping something unknown or unseen does not have to be motivated by a desire to, de- to deceive people, all right? And, and we know that. I mean, you know, at a 40th birthday party a few years ago, a few, a couple, and uh, Tandy kept it a secret from me. Don't say 10 real loud. I heard that, Kim Johnson. Get name and names. You didn't say it? Oh, sorry, Kevin Johnson. <laughs> but think about it. You know, so my wife kept it a secret. There wasn't a desire in her to deceive me. She was, she was trying to surprise me. So not all secrets are motivated by deception. Instead, keeping something secret can be a discipline that when executed properly promotes a greater awareness of God rather than a greater awareness of ourselves. So we want to talk about that a little bit tonight. Unfortunately, most things that people do are plastered all over social media for all to see, drawing plenty of attention to themselves and very little attention to God. You know, I think we can officially say that we live in the look at me, look at me generation. I mean, we do. Turn on TV, turn on the radio, turn on your social media accounts. We live in the look at me generation. There were times when my kids were young, and you probably experienced this as well. There were times when my kids were young that they would say, look at me, daddy, look at me, right? And they were, they were attempting something new, or they were discovering a new talent, or they were about to do something that was going to destroy something I dearly loved, right? Something like that was about to take place, and they wanted me to look at them and witness it. Some people, unfortunately, never grew out of the need to be seen. So rather than mature, they decided to monetize it and make a living at it. You say, what are you talking about? Turn on YouTube channel. Turn on TikTok. And you will find that people that look at me, look at me people have found a way not to necessarily have to mature, but to actually, you know, we can just make money at this. And we can make a living at this. Thus, today we are inundated with apps and sites to which you can subscribe to promote yourself, your talent, your skill set, your opinions. 
And we gauge our success by the number of likes and views and followers and subscribers that we maintain. But this isn't a new phenomenon. I have to laugh when I read that word because I could not figure out how to spell it. And Britta came by my office. I said, Britta, how do you spell phenomenon? And she spelled it right first time. So give her some. She's not in here, but tell her she did a good job next time you see her. Television executives for years and years have been using Nielsen ratings for decades to determine how many people are watching their shows. Literally, I'm not saying figuratively here, literally, we have tied success to how many people are looking at us. That's where we're at today. How many people are looking at me? How many people are seeing my show? How many people are subscribed to my channel? How many people are logging into my Facebook page or my Snapchat or my Instagram? How many people are following me? And we gauge success. Do you know what the most visited uh, video on YouTube is? It's something like 840 billion, I don't know, it's like crazy number of views. You're going to hate it when I say it. Baby shark, do, 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 baby shark. It is. I went online and looked it up. Baby shark. That's horrible. Pink Fong. That's the name of the per- the whoever that is. That's the billions and billions of people have watched that. It has nothing to do with my message. It's just weird to me. We jokingly say things like this, right? How many of you ever said this? If you didn't post it, it didn't happen. Right? Have you ever heard people say that? If you didn't post it, it didn't happen. Yet we are raising a generation of young adults that in some ways believe that to be true. If no one saw me, it doesn't count. Not just on a personal or professional level, but on a spiritual level as well. As I was thinking about that within the context of Jesus' teaching here in Matthew 6, he is distinguishing between the religious leaders of his day with those who were following him. And there is absolutely no doubt in my mind, if the Pharisees of Jesus' day had had access to social media, they would have used it. They would have used it. Think about this from Matthew 6 too. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. If they were going as far as to literally, listen, they were literally tooting their own horns, right? That's what it said. They were tooting. Is that what you thought, Jim, when you read that? They were blasting the trumpets when they gave to the needy. They were literally tooting their own horns in the streets and synagogues. If they would have done that, they certainly would have posted pics of themselves giving to the needy. Giving to help those in need was not their primary goal. The goal of their giving was to be seen by men. Not being seen was like it never happened. If they would have went in unannounced and gave that money to the needy and left without all the fanfare in their minds, it's like it never happened. If you didn't post it, it didn't happen. If you didn't blow your trumpet after you gave it, it didn't happen. You see, you can't build a reputation or a following among men by making your giving secret. However, you can build a tremendous reputation with God who sees everything, even the secret things. But for them, is all about attracting attention, right? So look at Matthew 6, 5 through 6. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in synagogues and on street corners. You seeing a theme? That they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you pray, go into your room, Shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. In this section of scripture, Jesus is comparing two types of people, right? He's, de- he's describing those who pray to draw a crowd and those who pray to draw God. You can pray in one of two ways. You can pray to draw a crowd or you can pray to draw God. Prayer for them had become a marketing strategy. 
That's what, it'd been, it, that's what it'd become to them. Prayer was simply a marketing strategy. When they prayed, it says that they prayed publicly, they prayed on street corners, and they prayed in synagogues. And they prayed loud, and they prayed proud. They made sure that people heard them, and they made sure that they were seen. But the goal was to attract a crowd. That was the whole goal. But to what end? Here's, here is, here's the answer to that to build a reputation and a following. That's what their ultimate goal was by praying so loud. They wanted to be seen as spiritual. They wanted to be seen as religious. They wanted to be seen as godly. Listen, if you think that we have, we're, we've evolved way past that in the church today, you're wrong. To look at social media accounts and you'll find out we just have different avenues and venues in which we do it by now. That's it. And so when we look at this passage of Scripture, we have to ask ourselves, what are we building? Are we building our reputation with men, or are we building our reputation with God? I would much rather walk into a room and no one knew me, but walk into the throne room and him know me by name. Amen? And that's what Jesus is pointing to here. He wants us to understand this perception that people have when it comes to building a reputation. This is where Jesus makes the distinction. You can either choose to use prayer to build a reputation among men or build a reputation with God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, it says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask it. In one of the versions, New Living Translation, it, said, it, it says that they should not pray. They don't babble before God. Don't use vain repetitions. I like the word babble. How about you guys? I think it's awesome. When God is, when God is not the focal point of your prayer life, okay, then your prayers are nothing but babble. If God is not the focus of your prayer life, then your prayers are nothing but babel. They are vain repetitions that are not rooted in any type of relationship. And they didn't care because they weren't trying to connect with God. They were trying to connect with men. They were trying to be seen as religious and spiritual. They were trying to say things and sound godly and sound spiritual and, 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 and elevate themselves so that men would see them and follow them. Prayer, however, that is God-centric is rooted in knowing the Father and knowing that He knows our needs before we ask them. So that's the power of real prayer. I don't have to babble when I go before God. I don't have to vainly repeat over and over and over and over something because I'm, I'm, I, God is not senile. God is not forgetful. God hears our prayers and responds to them. The thing is, is that if I walk in and I know who I'm talking to, right? You know, we always laugh. If you go into to Walmart and you don't get anywhere with the sales clerk, what do you do? You leave because the manager is probably not going to help you either. But no, I'm just teasing you. But you do, don't you? You ask for, you, whoever is helping you can't help you. You say, I want to speak to somebody greater than you, somebody that has more power than you, somebody that has more authority than you. When I was working in sales, they always told me, when you call, ask to talk with whoever the decision maker in the house was. It didn't matter if it was the wife or the husband or the three-year-old. Whoever was making the decisions in the house, that is who you wanted to speak to because you weren't making any progress unless you were talking to whoever was in charge. When you walk into the room and you know you're talking to Father God, you know you're talking to the greatest person in the room. You don't, you don't even have to ask. He already, isn't it great when I go to prayer that God already knows what I need before I walk in the room? He even knows what I'm getting ready to ask him before I walk in the room. He's already prepared his answer. And sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait. Sometimes the answer is I hear you, but we're going to do it a little different. You know, I don't know in my life if God has ever answered the prayer the way that I think he should have answered the prayer. I don't even know if I can remember one time he answered it exactly the way I thought this was going to turn out. But it always turned it out for my best. Am I good? Because I went right to the Father. You see, you won't pray vain prayers. You won't pray. You won't just babble before God when you know you've got the guy in the room that can make the decisions. 
then you'll ask the questions that need to be asked because of your relationship with him, right? Nestled kind of among these verses is some great teaching. You say, well, Pastor, are you going to get into the Lord's Prayer tonight? I'm not even going to teach on it tonight. You'll say, you're not going to teach on the Lord's Prayer? That's like the whole focus of chapter 6 is the Lord's Prayer. We always study it. Did you know the Lord's Prayer is not the focus of chapter 6? It is not the focus. It is not the primary reason for Jesus' teaching. If you read it, you will find that he talks about giving. He talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. But the common denominator among the three is the pressing need of connecting each of those things, right? What had happened was superficial spirituality was replacing true worship. That's what was happening. Superficial spirituality was replacing true worship. People were coming and they were giving. How many know that at the end of the day that the needy do not care if they got $10 from a guy that's just trying to draw attention to himself or $10 from a person who has a heart for God and did it for the right reasons in secret. This has nothing to do with the needy. This has to do with the giver. This has to do with our hearts. This has to do when we step into the room is that what is our heart in the giving? The needy don't care. I've never walked up to somebody and say, are you a real Christian? No, they just take the money. And then most of the time they don't even say thank you. (laughs) And you know what's interesting? In both those situations, neither of those people care because the the one person is not doing it for their gratitude. They're still only doing it to draw a crowd. And the other people don't mind because they weren't doing it for the needy person. They were doing it for God. And God will see and reward them, right? So in in this situation, we focus so much on the needy part, giving and, and giving to people in need. But the reality is what Jesus is addressing is this superficial spirituality that was being demonstrated and not real genuine worship in giving. That's what he's dealing with. Think about how social media today has influenced friendships. Friendships, I have friends Friends that I actually spend time with and I sit with and I eat with, right? And then I have social media friends. Friends who like my post. Friends that encourage me online. But I never spend any time with them whatsoever. And so we have, those friendships are superficial. They are. But in the, in the culture today, our kids, your kids who are being born today and raised up, they're being raised up in a generation. Listen, I've got a 16-year-old daughter that consistently I'm having to encourage her to actually go to her friend's house and hang out. Because why, Dad? We just Snapchatted like 15, 15 times in the last 20 seconds. Right? To, to them, that's Friendship. To them, that's, 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 that's what the reality of friendship is. That's what it looks like in our culture. They don't even understand the concept. I, when I wanted to go hang out with my friend, I had to get on my bike and ride six miles to their house. And I'm like, why couldn't I find a friend between here and there? Why did that guy live so far away from me? But it's the truth. We, we, we had to get on our bikes and go places. We had to take the phone off the wall, and we could only go as far as the cord stretched <laughs> to talk to people. And you know what my mom would say? Why are you talking on the phone with them? Just get on your bike and ride over to their house and go play. And we'd go out in the woods for hours and hours and hours. We, would, we, they, we could be lost, and my parents would not know. They would just say, dinner time, and we'd all come home again, Right? <laughs> Come on, how, that's the way we were raised in that. But not our kids. Our kids are raised in a different culture. My kids that say, Dad, I need to get on my phone because I, I got a 487 day streak going with one of my friends that I can't, if I miss a day, we go back to zero. See, the young people are laughing, going, I know what you're talking about. The old people are going, The only streaks I know about, we cannot talk about in church. <laughs> right? Because your mom would get on to you about them, pick them up off the floor and put them in the dirty clothes basket. I went there. But isn't it true, though? Young people are nodding their head. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Older people in the room are going, I have no idea. I tried to do this with my, I tried to do, I have a streak with Jenna. 
And Jenna would have to come in and remind me to get online and do it because I would forget. She said, four days, Dad. Four days was the longest you ever could do it and remember to do it. And, you know, I told her, I said, that's because I see you every day. I don't need to remember to go online to tell you that I know you're alive. I woke you up this morning. I fixed you breakfast this morning. I drove you to school this morning. You know, I know I see you every, I've got a relationship with you. I don't need this superficial friendship with you. I have a real relationship with you. You see, that's what, and we're living in a culture that is completely different from what we've grown up in, and we don't understand it. But Jesus was addressing some of this. Think about how social media has influenced communication. Used to be if we had disagreements, we settled them, you know, talking face to face, but we found anonymity in social media where we could say mean things and we hide behind fake profile pictures and we can say all the mean things we want. And if we don't like you, unfriend. Right? We can't, we didn't do that in my day. You had to cut their face completely out of the yearbook if you wanted to unfriend them. Back in my day. Come on. People are like, yeah. The young people are going, what's a yearbook? What's a yearbook? (laughs) Communication. Dating is different. Dating's different. Right? You had to to work up the nerve and, and throw up on a tree before you asked the girl to go to the dance with you. And now you just go onto a dating app and say, I like dogs and I like giraffes and unicorns. And then they match you up with somebody. And you've never met them in your whole life. My parents used to warn me about things like that. <laughs> do, not, do not go meet up with those people. Now there's whole apps and they send you out there into the world. Is this being recorded tonight? I may have to back up. <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing that really bothers me though. Social media has had a damaging effect on self-image is what it's had. A damaging effect on self-image. Because uh, I, I share with Jenna all the time, you know, when we, where you're looking at Facebook and you're looking at all these things. I said, I said you're, you're only seeing people's highlight reel all the time. You're not seeing the real deal. You're not seeing, you're not seeing what I'm hearing in my office when I'm dealing with couples that are struggling and people who are on drugs and addicted. You see them at the beach and they're smiling and the next week they're in my office because they're getting ready to go to prison for dealing meth. And they didn't post that on their social media site, right? Or people will, you know, it's funny because people will use those filters on themselves. And I'm like, I know you. You do not look like this at all. <laughs> I, you know, I'm worried. I'm like, I want to tell people, do not use a filter on your face. If you are in a car wreck, they will not know it's you. Because <laughs> you do not look like that at all. But the thing is, is that we don't like who we are. And we can change who we are with a filter on Facebook, but in reality, we can't change that until we get into the secret place of the Father and we learn who we are in Jesus and we start to appreciate who we are in Christ. Then things begin. All of You see, the social media has been trying to replace the genuine with the superficial. Superficial Friendships, superficial communication, superficial dating, superficial self-image. So much so that we don't even recognize ourselves anymore. In Matthew 6, 16 through 18, it says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. That your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. In the New Living Translation, it says, They tried to look miserable and disheveled so people would admire their spirituality. Here's the point. They were trying to pawn off superficial spirituality as genuine worship. That's what they were doing. That's what Jesus is addressing here. It doesn't mean that there's not some good points about prayer and fasting and giving. There are. And then listen, the Lord's Prayer is awesome. But that is not what Jesus is addressing in chapter 6. He's addressing this superficial spirituality that he was seeing in the religious leaders of that day. And he's still addressing it today. He's still addressing it today with many of us. 
Superficial means this, appearing to be true or real only until examined more closely. Something looks good from a distance until you get up on it. Remember when Jesus saw the fig tree and leaf outside of Jerusalem, he went because he thought it was bearing fruit. When he got there and found no fruit upon it, he cursed it (laughs) because it was superficial. Jesus was combating the tendency of men to make their giving, prayer, and fasting about themselves rather than taking those things into the secret place with God where he would be glorified. When I read that, I I immediately thought of a passage that we've already studied in Matthew 5, 16. Notice this passage, okay? It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You might read that passage and think, does that like totally just contradict what you just said? We're supposed to do this in secret. Do your giving in secret. Do your prayer in secret. Do your fasting in secret. And then it just says, let your light shine. Let them see your good works and give glory to God. Is it contradictory to what's been taught? But if you read verse 16 carefully, it says that they will see your good works. It doesn't say they'll see you. See, the, the, the purpose of the good works in, in the Pharisees' mind is I want them to see me. In my mind, I want them to see God. And that is how our giving should work. That's how our prayer should work. That's how our fasting should work. It should ultimately evolve or it should involve God getting the glory out of it, regardless of what happens. When I give, I shouldn't be even recognized as being in the room when it happened, as long as God gets the glory. If we're giving in such a way where people are praising me for what has been given, I've done it wrong. I need to do my giving in such a way. I love it. I won't, of course, I won't mention any names because I'd be completely upending this whole message. But you would be surprised at the number of people when there are needs in the church that will come to me and say, hey, give this to so-and-so. Don't let them know who it's from. Yeah, that's fine. Sometimes I'll just find an envelope on my desk that'll say, so, for so-and-so. And so I don't because it doesn't matter who it's from. Because the goal of it is for God to be glorified in it. Because if the, if the word out of their mouth is, oh, who gave this to me? I want to thank them. My answer is, don't thank them, thank God. He's the one that dealt with their hearts. He's the one that gave them the provision to be able to help you in this time. They're just a conduit. How many of you this morning got up, went outside, knelt down in your yard where your water line runs in and thank the pipes that carried your water into your house today. Now we all kind of smirk. That's dumb. Well, it's kind of silly too to come and thank me for something that I'm simply a conduit of from God to you. That's all I am when in my giving. And I'm just really just an old piece of pipe that's carrying the blessing to you in that situation. I guess it'd be plastic nowadays, right? Not old rusty pipe, but plastic (laughs) carrying the water in. The only way that my giving, prayer, and fasting can be adequately gauged is by the amount of glory that God receives because of it. That's That's the only way to really gauge it. How do I gauge my giving? How much glory has God got from it? How do I gauge my prayer? How much glory has God got from it? You know, I was reading a friend of mine. We want to pray tonight as we close in here in just a few minutes for our friends at Oak Hill Christian Center in Evansville, Assembly of God Church. Pastor Fawn uh, is the pastor down there. Uh, They have a rampant outbreak of COVID, and it is a nasty strain of this. Uh, The pastor's wife is in the hospital. Several others are in the hospital. It is, I mean, they got like 24, 26 people that are struggling right now at, at their church. And we want to pray for them tonight for God to do a healing miracle in their lives uh, this evening. But uh, one of the things that he, he mentioned, and he said, whoever was praying, he just made this post, he said, whoever was praying at whatever time, 1.45 a.m. this morning, thank you. And he says, I felt the presence of God come into the room and meet a need in our life in that moment. You know, it's interesting, he has no idea who it was. Whoever prayed, though, was the conduit of that blessing to them because they were obedient to wake up and to pray for that family and for that need in that moment. Sometimes when God wakes you up, he's waking you up because you are going to be the conduit of that prayer that goes to that person in that moment and brings a miracle into their lives. 
when we're fasting and we're seeking God, we're trying to draw near to God, the outcome of our fasting is not for our own spiritual benefit. But read Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 58 that the outcome of fasting is to bless others. It's to bless other people. We're conduits. And that's what he keeps talking over and over through this passage of Scripture is that we have to get our eyes off of ourselves. Giving, get your eyes off of yourself. Prayer, get your eyes off of yourself. And you say, well, not always. Sometimes I pray for myself and my own needs. In fact, I do 90% of my praying that way. That you need to go back and read Matthew chapter 6 because the Lord's prayer focuses very little on you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Oh, then we might pray, give us this day our daily bread. So there's a little bit. But then we start refocusing again on forgiving others their debts. Right? So it isn't about us. The majority, listen, 90% of your prayer time shouldn't even be about you. Because we're conduits, we're conduits. We believe that. If you were in, a, how many were in the grow group that we had not that long ago? We were talking about when we pray for others, we bring them into the presence of God with us. Isn't that a powerful teaching? That statement just revolutionizes the way we pray, that when we pray, we bring people into the very presence of God. That changes the way we look at prayer. But it's not about us. It's about like the four men that, that, that carried the paralytic to Jesus and tore the roof off and let him down. They weren't benefiting at all from it. They were just a conduit of the blessing that happened in that man's life. And so are we. And then, we, it, it, so we see, give in secret. When we give in secret, we do so so that God is seen, not you and I. When we pray in secret, we do so God is seen and not you and I. When we, when we fast, we fast in secret so God is seen, not you and I. And what is really interesting to me is that that there are no secrets with God. You can't keep any secrets from God at all. When we're keeping secrets, we're just keeping secrets from men. Right? If, I, if God lays, me, lays it on my heart to be a blessing to somebody, I don't need Loretta to know. I don't need Jeff to know. I don't need Mark to know. I don't need him to know. I just know that God has commanded me to do that. He's encouraged me to do that, so I do it in the secret place, and, and what I love about it is that God sees it. God sees it. Don't you ever, don't you love that when you see your kids, kids do something good and they don't know that you were watching them? Right? You see them doing something good and they didn't know that you were watching them. There's a big difference between that and when they're trying to get your attention. Hey, watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me do this. Watch me do this. Look at me do this. Isn't there a different feeling? When you're catching your kids doing something good compared to because they thought they were doing it. Now, sometimes your kids do stuff in secret and you catch them doing it and you're going to string them up, yeah. right? You're gonna, <laughs> we're about to do some hurting on some kids because they're doing, tying the cat up to the other cat and running them down the street. Not that I ever did that, uh, but the, uh, <laughs> I never did that. I'm just saying I never did that. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> let, me just, let me just say this. Giving, prayer, and fasting is most sincere when it is done in secret, when, where we hide ourselves in him so that he receives all the glory. So when I'm in the secret place, I'm with him. And, and it's kind of like, it, it's like I'm giving it, you know, remember when somebody comes to me and they give me the money and they say, hey, give this to somebody else. You know, I'm the conduit of that. So when I come in, God is the conduit of my giving. I come in and I give to God, you know, and I say, God, because that's and as I say what we're supposed to do. We give to him. And it says that he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. We giving, we're giving it to God, and God is the conduit to those people. And that's why God gets the blessing, right? Come here, Hannah, real quick. I know, and she thrilled. She's like, Dad, this is live on TV right now. What are you doing? So the, the, the deal is this, is that, that if, if she's standing here and I say, hey, Give this, give this to them. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm hiding behind her. So, are you doing good with that? Are you giving it to them? You tossed it to them? All right. But here's the key. You can't see me. Maybe you can, but if I get a little started. You can't see me. You can still see me. You can sit down, Hannah. I get in, when I get into the secret place and I get behind God, who, does, who do they see? 
They see God. They don't see me. Now, if I get out in front of her and I say, God, let me give it to them, then who do they see? They see me. And that's what that whole chapter, that whole, chapter 6, all of those passages, the whole thing, that's what it's about. Jesus is saying, listen, the religious leaders of this day, they want to get in front of God and they want to receive the praise. But the people who are following me, they want to tuck in behind God and they want people to see him. That's it. That's the, that's the entire teaching. It's, it's not deep but God is, doesn't want superficial spirituality. He doesn't want you to, be a, to, to post a scripture on Facebook but not live it in person. To post something, that, to put a fish on your car and yet drive like the devil. Right? I mean, it's a people go, now you're just meddling, need to be quiet right now in Jesus' name. Right? We wear a cross around our neck while we're cussing out our boss. We're wearing a Jesus Saves t-shirt, right, while we're fussing at the person for cutting in line in front of us at Walmart. All, all of us, all, what I'm saying is it's superficial. All those things are superficial. We're not really living those things out in real life. It's superficiality. It's the same way. You know, I can be very spiritual. You know what, today, here's something funny, that, and I'll just tell on myself. I have a habit of doing that. I typed out a Facebook post today, and I see if I can remember how it goes. I was just being silly. I said, this is what I put, the religious leaders of Jesus' day would not have recognized God if he had come down and died on the cross for them. That's what I, that, I, that, I typed it up. I said, the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day would not have recognized God if he had come down and died on the cross for them. And I laughed, and I thought, that's just being a little cheeky. And I just deleted it. <laughs> but I, but the, the, the funny part of that is, you know why I deleted it? Because that really wasn't the message I wanted to communicate. It was funny. It was a little bit true because they didn't recognize him, and he did come down and die for them. But what I recognized, I, 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 literally, I left it on my desk sitting next to me, typed up, like right here, I'm working on the message, giggling at it as I'm looking at it, thinking, should I send it? Should I not send it? Should I post it? Should I not post it? And the Lord, about three times in, he said, if you had to look at that thing three times to decide whether you're going to send that or not, he said, you need to delete it. He says, that is not what you put on Facebook. Because that is not, that's funny, but that is not, that's, that's superficial. That's not depth. And so I hit delete off of it. Now, there was nothing wrong with that. There was really nothing. Nobody would have looked at that post and said, Pastor Scott's being sacrilegious. They, most people would have just giggled, right, and thought that's kind of funny. It's true, but it's kind of funny. But it really doesn't, it wasn't communicating the heart of what Jesus was wanting to teach us in Matthew 6. What Jesus was wanting to teach us is that there is superficial spirituality is no replacement for genuine worship. That's what needs to be taught. That's what needs to be received tonight. Amen? So I want you to stand with me around this room. We want to pray tonight. We're going to take a few minutes here as we close together. I want to pray for our friends at Oak Hill. We want to pray for Raleigh Clark, who's going to have open heart surgery tomorrow. We want to pray for Jan McGrew. Uh, she doesn't have to have surgery, but she needs a healing in her body tonight in Jesus' name. But we, uh, and if you've got just, a, if you got needs in your life tonight, need healing in this room, I just want you to lift your hands towards heaven tonight. Father, I want to thank you tonight. Lord, this is a place where, this isn't superficial here. We believe, God, your word declares where any two are gathered in your name, that you're in the midst of them. Lord, we know you're here. We know that you're here. And we know that you are a God that heals. And we know that you're a God that restores. And we know that, God, you're a God that answers. And so, Lord, as we come tonight, Father, we begin by lifting up, Lord, some of our own people. We lift up Jan McGrew to you tonight in Jesus' name. Lord God, we thank you that the MRI came back. And, Lord, that she does not need surgery. But, God, she needs healing. 
And so tonight, in the name of Jesus, God, we ask that you would release the healing virtue of Christ into her body. Lord, that you would be glorified in her. Lord, we lift up Raleigh to you. And Lord, as he goes in for this major surgery tomorrow, that the presence and glory of God would go with him. And Lord God, that you would heal him completely. Strengthen his body. Lord, give him his energy back and his strength back and his mobility back and his ability, Father God. Lord, I thank you that, that you are strengthening him even tonight. Give him peace that surpasses all understanding. Give Kathy peace that surpasses all understanding tonight. And Father, I lift up Pastor Jeremy and Stephanie Fawn and, and the whole Oak Hill family. Lord, we love them so much. We love that entire church and we love their ministry staff for Christian Miranda's wife, Susie, who is struggling, for Sam Yakel's wife, who is struggling tonight. They need healing in Jesus' name. Father God, we come against every principality and power in Jesus' name that has exalted itself against this church. Father God, we bind every disease at the name of Jesus. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are the Lord, our healer. We thank you tonight, God, that the healing virtue of Christ is being released, God, like a mighty wave, Father, over them. And Lord, that every, every last cell of this disease, this COVID, God, is being dismissed and dismissed dispersed and defeated at the name of Jesus tonight. Lord, I thank you, God. Lord, I thank you for victory. The enemy has come in like a flood, but God, you are raising up a standard against it. Father, it stops here tonight. Father God, it stops here. As we go to prayer for them, God, it stops here tonight. Lord, no further. And Lord, now the enemy has got to retreat. We thank you for that healing that's being released. Father, we praise you tonight. Father, I want to praise you. I want to lift up Pastor Britta tonight. Lord, it's Sunday. She's preaching. She's bringing the word Sunday morning. And Father, she gave me a sneak peek today of what she's preaching. And Father, it's powerful. Father, I, don't, I, I, they, they, I, was, I was caught off guard by just how good a message that she's bringing. Lord, and I knew she had it in her, but Lord, she's coming both barrels burning. And so, Father, I just want to thank you in advance, God, for, for, I want you to bring everybody, all the people that need to be here, be here. Lord, that every excuse, God, would be set aside, that, Father God, plans that they have made would fall through, and that, Lord, that their option is to be here on Sunday morning to hear this word. Father, I believe you're going to change some hearts and transform some lives th this coming Sunday. And miracles, signs, and wonders are going to follow the preaching of the Word. Father, I thank you for that tonight. Lord, I thank you, God. I want to lift up. He's not here tonight, but I just want to say a big happy birthday to Brother John Noss. Today is his 73rd birthday. He's enjoying time with family tonight. But, Father, I pray that you would bless Brother John. Lord, because if he was here, I'd be singing to him. And so I already, I already called him today and wished him a happy birthday. But, Father, we just want to ask your blessing over him and Judy tonight. Father, we give you all the praise and glory. And Lord, it is our heart's desire, Lord God, that we will not allow superficial spirituality, Father, to take the place of our genuine worship. That we will find our secret place in you, and God will receive all the glory through our giving, through our prayer, and through our fasting. In Jesus' name, and the church declares, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Hey, listen, don't forget, men, if you're signing up for the baseball, make sure you get back there. If you're, you can take wives, kids, anybody can come with you. Uh, Pastor Rob just needs to have a number on tickets.